And please, everyone, come closer to us if you want to join the debate. We are, and this is sort of an experiment today. Um, come to us and move if you uh, don't hear or don't see. Um, we're happy to have you close around us. You don't have to, though. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Peter and Boris, thanks so much for um, for the film. Um, that's actually a film um, that is working really close on the film material, on the analog film material. And um, I know that you're all also you're burying film material, you're painting over it, you're even bleaching film materials. I really want to know what these images and the film material, um, what did these films do to you? Why are you getting so physical? Um, well, I like to think about film material as a living organism. And um, it's just really nice to see how it uh, transforms under our hands um, I think it's um, it's a nice way to connect uh, with the material and uh, feel it. Um, so basically, this is uh, what it does to me. Mm. Uh, for me, I really like to destroy uh, in the kindergarten, you know, uh, old toys, you know, like little cars my brother's cars. And I really like to throw stones and etc. and uh, see what's happened with the little toys if you, you know, put uh, behind a car or uh, etc. And maybe <laughs> that's why I really enjoy to destroy physical images because it's a really, uh, it's a nice feeling to you know, to to see what happened <laughs> with, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger had if you dig into the soil and if you put into the soil for two weeks with uh, rotten apples and milk and water and you just watch the, you, you can you can see, you, you can play as a, as a child in a, you know, child labor. So you literally bur buried cinema, right? Yes. Yeah, um but it was, you know, it was just a play. Uh it was just a play for us. So the the burying is not a, you know, political manifesto. But you made the decision for uh, special images. I mean, it's not just burying film material, but it's also the, the decision which material you you're burying, isn't it? Um, yes, but uh, at the end it was a little bit random because it's uh, it's really difficult to get uh, 35 millimeter films. Um, you know, half of the images were you know you know buy on eBay, and other half, other half of the reels was a little bit you know uh, semi illegal, semi legal, little bit illegal to get some reels uh, <laughs> from the back, you know, of old cinema theaters, from projectionists who, you know, sell material uh, for collectors. Um, and we collected for three years materials uh, from anywhere, uh, from the old film archive and from, you know, flea markets, etc. So, at the you know end product is a little bit random because you cannot plan. Oh, you, I I, I want to use I don't know, Jean Luc Godard images. So you you don't you cannot get a Jean Luc Godard for you know digging, uh, <laughs> but it would be nice. You know I I really, you know wanted to get for example Belatar movies to to dig uh, into the soil, but it was almost impossible. Uh, but it would be great. So Did you ask him? No, no, I, no, I, it, it, oof, I'm really afraid of Bilatar, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, we have great vodka, by the way, so if you come closer, you might get one too. Um, 
By the way, uh, yeah, of course, the other film uh, was made by Cam Camilo Restrepo, who is a filmmaker from Colombia, um, who made his first film in 2011. And he's been living in and working in Paris since 1999. He's working with a analog film material lab called uh, Lab Dominable. And um, the film was created in that kind of experimental film scene context. Um, we made an interview with him, which you can find in our lovely book, uh, Koschke, which you can buy outside, by the way. Um, strong recommendation. Uh, rock strong recommendation to read that one um, actually I, I'd like to quote um, a line from him uh, which says there is no original no fixed identity instead one has the possibility of being a lot of things at the same time um, we could maybe say that he works in a way with performance or space in a way which is similar to maybe how you work with um, the film material um, I'm wondering how that quote resonates with you. Do you see similarities in, in the way you work? Um. Um, I'm, it's, it's so similar it is to Miklos Jancho's movie in that one, but it maybe it's a very you know, vague association. And I saw similarities that uh, he used, uh, they used uh, language and you know, music as a ritual because uh, we try to use Shakespeare's as Shakespeare Shakespeare's text me meant to be used you know as a poem not as a dramatic text or dialogue it's just a poem and uh, to use the musicality of the Hungarian language uh, which is maybe even a little bit music more musical than the original English and uh, I saw these kind of similarities between the two movies. But I didn't start to, you know, terrorize during the screening. I just dived into, you know, the film, which I really liked. I think it's just maybe one could see the similarity in, in, in the statement that there is not the original existing. So you're not only working with your own material, but in a way you one could say, in a provocative way, steal the material from others. Um, but it's the same for you if it's your material or others' material. Um, w when we were discussing that, we were discussing also a lot about alienating, in a way, images or relocating them, transforming them in a, in a, new, in a new context. Do you, do you feel the difference when you work with your own material or with f material from others? No, the, f I, I, uh, the funny thing is that uh, when you start to work with, you know, found footage, and uh, even if it's downloaded from the internet, or you know, as a celluloid strips, you can touch. You start to look at the images as your own. So basically, you know, at at a point, we just look the images and the strip. Oh, that's nice. It's you know, Bruce Willis. But uh, <laughs> but in one point we start to not watch you know the films as the others we start to you know uh, appropriate you know, the images as own our own images so it's you know that's why it's really uh, fun to work with um, amateur uh, footages because amateur footages amateur home movies are not you know in the collective mind of the viewer it's just you know there is one piece of and uh, all of the amateur footages so that's why it's really fun to appropriate amateur footages uh, in an interview i read uh, you did that together with da dan brown and it's going to be published soon um you were in conversation about your strategies um within your experimental kind of filmmaking um there you say when the cinema wants to become reality it always fails to be art um, Jean-Pierre Becolo, do you see um, questions of reality being negotiated in Peter and Boris' film? Is there any agenda in this work for you? I, um, I can start by saying that I was very impressed you know, by the, the process. Um, obviously, the idea that you produce films without filming anything. Uh, so, so that's very interesting. Uh, that's kind of radical uh, to, to produce images without filming. Um, 
uh, it made me think of, um, uh, I would say like, not like IRM images, like okay, body images that are also, like with all this technology, you can travel in a body and it becomes a film, but it was not really filmed, it's like from a real object. Uh, and it also like, in relation to all these 3D, whatever, special effects that are not really filmed uh, somewhere else. Um, but the, the most interesting part, I think, is the reappropriation uh, of, uh, and it reminded me in Uganda, you have these guys that are being called VJs. Mm -hmm. So they take Hollywood films, and these guys start talking, saying things. I think he's remaking his own film because I remember this guy VJing The Matrix. <coughs> and then uh, he speaks in his uh, language, which is Baganda. And then nobody's talking, but he's talking. Uh, because he's supposed to be like repeating dialogues and stuff. And then I ask him, so what are you saying? He said, I'm setting up the whole story. And you discover that what is actually and the matrix can be very difficult to translate. You know, it doesn't matter which language, but as a word. And, and then you discover that he's actually making his own film. And sometimes those films might be better than the the original one. So I kind of like the reappropriation because when people who make those films think that they can send them to Africa and people will be all happy to watch, I don't know, Julia Roberts or somebody like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they, they don't. They would watch the one, the Julia Roberts, they decide, you know, like, uh, this is what she is, actually. Mm -hmm. You were also using the term radical. Um, could you, uh, is, is that linked somehow for you to an idea of transformation? Um, I, I really think the... the I'd say this physical gesture <laughs> of taking a film and burning or whatever, I don't know, the recipe, I like the recipe with apples, like <laughs> <laughs> milk apple and <laughs> I don't know what else, and the earth, you know, producing something, you know, like this. And and I, I think um, the, the intervention, you know, the, uh, and I also like the parallel of when you're saying you like destroying things <laughs> because we have a very romantic idea of how you know, all these things are done, or mainly film, maybe all the art is kind of the same, but with film we have a kind of uh, uh, romantic idea of how uh, everything is so great, and uh, so, and I like that idea of uh, of expressing some of human feelings, you know, while doing this thing. Uh, we were wondering, um, when you talk about destroying things, with This can also mean just to change them. Um, we are. We were wondering actually whether whether a kind of transformation or destruction um, is always linked to an agenda, or whether whether maybe that can be a goal in itself. Um, maybe that question goes to all of you. Um, well, when you think about caterpillar becoming like butterfly, I think you know there's a kind of transformation there too, and and I kind of think also there's kind of something be destroyed or something that is looks ugly becoming beautiful. I don't know. Just like that. But that would mean that transformation is always positive. Do you think th that's a term that is uh, that has a positive connotation when you, we think of the butterfly? No, I think it's different. Uh, I think it's a process. Uh, I don't even know if the caterpillar knows that it's going to become a butterfly. I don't know, but it's you know, a process that end up producing something else. You know, maybe better than what was there before. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. mm, you've been wor you've been working on films which have a, maybe we could say a strategy linked to them or a political impetus of irritating expectations towards African cinema. Um, in a way, to me, they seem sometimes didactical a little bit. Like you were really negotiating um, politics or constellations between people in positions of power or not, um, linked to communities. Mm. I'm wondering whether this kind of didactical approach 
is actually sparking or challenging a kind of um, transformation or maybe you would not even say transformation but maybe change? I kind of like making things against what is there. You know, uh, I'm more inspired when I'm against something. But when I'm for something, it's more complicated. I'm not sure. I'm hesitating. So so, um, so I like when I don't like a film, really. I know what I don't want, really. And, and I think I'm very clear uh, in that sense uh, when I'm trying to... Uh, yes, to explain why I don't like something, what I feel like. And I think I had that connection with African cinema. I didn't like African cinema when it started, when it started really. Uh, and that's what helped me kind of articulate a cinema based on what I didn't like. But what I like came after, you know, I would say. So uh, African cinema, a lot of it was like NGO cinema, you know, like... Uh, any NGO issue, you had a film that was like the correspondent of, you know. Uh, uh, so I, uh, 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 I may, maybe it's also some kind of energy Africa produce. Uh, people who feel like they have to save Africa, you know, somehow. And I always wonder what relation this has with cinema. Uh, uh, when I teach, sometimes I will I would ask a uh, student what film they like, uh, and then I will ask them uh, what film they want to make. Most of the time, they like films we all like, you know. But the the one they want to make is always like NGO type or something. And then I ask them if they would go and watch their own films. The answer is actually honestly no. And then the question is, what is cinema then? And I think challenging the definition of cinema or reinventing it all the time is actually something I think is important. Uh, and um, unfortunately, I felt that uh, even if there are many reasons why one should celebrate the, f the first generation of African filmmakers, but I think at some point, uh, the question is, what is cinema for me is always at stake. So cinema is a transformative force also um, for the audience that is watching the films in that way. Yeah, but there's, it's like in, uh, in the art, like just what this film is doing, you don't um, know. It's like you're following a creative mind. You know, that's really what you do. You're following a director, a dreamer, with whatever his fantasies. But this cannot all be predictable. And I mean, beyond the question of liking, um, if you say you reject or want to question a certain kind of cinema, this might also be linked to a notion of change, right? Or claiming change or hoping for change. Mm. We we were wondering when we are, when we were thinking about ideas of transformation, especially um, in Restrepo's film, um, there might be an idea linked to the film that. Um, we might need to understand first what we want to change or transform. Mm. Would you agree with that? Same for you, Peter. Would you agree with that? Mm. Can you repeat the question? It was a little bit long for me. We were wondering whether, um, in case you want to change uh, a perception of cinema, if you want to agitate a certain kind of cinema, whether this agitation is based on understanding first? Um, yeah, any kind of agitation or any kind of um, speaking has to be based on understanding first. Basically, that's why I ask you to repeat your question because I don't want to speak without understanding the question. Um, I would disagree, I think, because I think that there could be um, a notion of maybe a coincidence maybe something that you don't understand at first, maybe something that you maybe don't even know at first. For example, in your film, that's uh, for me the sound level, that's at some point when we are leaving the structure of the text and when there is the rain and the sound of the lightning, 
which really strikes me every time I see it again. And um, also Restrepo came to that when we had the interview, I think. And what you see in, in La Bouche, he says every object um, is a new idea for the viewer. Um, yeah, um, b basically you're absolutely right. Uh, I think art starts when this kind of you know, notions came into the picture. So art is you know, art has to be, or filmmaking, or, you know, any kind of, I don't know, artistic creation has to be more than just, you know, put an agenda into a box and give to the audience. So if the film is more clever than the director, is the film became good. So I hope the film um, we made uh, is uh, more clever than us. So you're absolutely right. I don't know, I answered your question. Yeah, I think it's just um, talking about if transformation always has an aim or not, or if something maybe just happens that we don't understand at first, that maybe objects, which are quite present also in, in La Bouche, um, uh, have maybe having their own energy or their own, own force in a way. Um, Jean-Pierre Becolo, what kind of artistic practice do you see negotiated in La Bouche? I would say I saw an idea of, how do you say, traduction, traduction, tra transla no, translation, traduction, mm. uh, like uh, translating whatever is said in a song into visual. Uh, so obviously, translation is supposed to be from one language to another. Um, also two languages, but I think the visual, translating the text into visual, and uh, I think it was kind of um, interesting. And uh, obviously, I guess, they say speaking, I think, in Bambara, the song is in Bambara, and I, I imagine that the filmmaker uh, did not speak Bambara at first, and then, but he got meaning of what it was and adapted it visually. Uh, in this just little dance and and which is kind of impressive really to to achieve that translation and uh obviously uh, what is very interesting um imagine people who are like bambara and who listen to that song and dance i don't think they would have translated that way really so i thought it was a very nice cultural uh, translation or, 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 I don't know how to put it, not exchange, but you could feel that it was in an encounter between one person and a material, the filmmaker with some cultural material that was not his culture. And cinema was making it almost, providing him elements to make it universal. Like, me, I don't speak Bambara, but the mise-en-scene really spoke to me like if I was just listen to the song, and I guess uh, that what kind of shows the universal dimension of cinema in a way, when it's done, uh, that's it. At the same time, it's more than a translation, I'd say. Um, when when he was in conversation, in conversation with Vivian, he mentioned, I had the feeling of being in the sound rather than in the sense. So there's also a level of, a strong level of experience in that film, I'd say. Would you share that impression? Yeah, yeah, completely. I, I would say, uh, because now we go back to what cinema is, really. Uh, uh, obviously, it won't be like a text translation. You know, you use all the dynamic of cinema for what it is and and uh, and the use of it. I mean, if I don't like it to be the, the whole utilitarian dimension of cinema, but I just think somehow... Um, uh, he was able to give us a very beautiful piece uh, uh, because he was trying to translate whatever, uh, and this is not literally, and I guess uh, that's why he's talking about sound. Uh, it was also uh, motion, motion in many ways. Yeah. Um, in one of your films, Aristotle's plot that I just recently saw again, uh, there's a, um, 
a very nice um, uh, dialogue where um, he's saying, I'm a filmmaker, and somebody's answering, you're a daydreamer. And um, I'm wondering, because, um, I mean, cinema is also in a state of um, change, um, like, always, and in, in times of um, digitali digitalization, um, even more. And um, could you say working with analog film material would both films that we saw today do, in a way, um, does it have some notion of nostalgia, in a way? Is it progressive? Uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, if you consider a filmmaker as an artist, the artist should be free to choose the material he's going to work with. I don't think we chose to work with digital, really. It's a kind of trend. It's a kind of impose on us. It becomes the only thing you can use. And, and I don't see how progressive you are using digital. Do you really have a choice? <laughs> So, uh, but I would actually say somebody who decides to work with analog while he can work with digital has made a choice. And a choice that is expensive and maybe more challenging. You can't do as many takes as you want. Uh, so I just think that um, uh, you could feel a kind of artistic, you say, démarche, like an artistic uh, 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 decision more with somebody using analog today when digital is being imposed on us. Mm. Yeah, in a way, there's also maybe a resistant quality to not agreeing to use the usual standards, which are more wi widespread, maybe? I think, I mean, when you, it goes to cinema, there's so many things that are imposed on people who practice cinema. And I think... Uh, People talk about independent cinema. I don't see how independent actually we are. Uh, we, even the structure of the story we're telling, uh, that's why I like these two films, even the, story, the structure of the story we're telling is uh, being imposed. I made this four hours film that was at Berlinale three years ago and everybody was like, it's too long. But uh, I always say that if I think what I've done for the last four hours, I didn't do much. Uh, but asking somebody to watch something for four hours, you feel like it's too long. So, so you realize that there are all these format uh, that are imposed on us, uh, and then uh, we kind of accept them and we live with them like if it was kind of natural. Uh, but uh, the idea of being independent is actually always to try to free ourselves in our practice from any kind of forces or any kind of constraints that is imposed on us. Um, can Peter, can there be any kind of reactionary cinema? Can cinema itself be reactionary or revisionist, turned backwards? Um, yeah, I think cinema has to deconstruct, you know, the thing. If if you know, revi revisionism is deconstruction of something. Uh, know because uh, it, it's a good word to describe this film you know the rub uh, with the deconstruction because yeah we bleach it and we destroy the images uh, but uh, every filmmaking has to be deconstructive in a way that you know you have to deconstruct the schemas and you have to deconstruct the you know genres and you have to deconstruct all of the type of uh, storytelling, even if you make, um, you know, narrative film, not just, you know, hardcore experimental. So that's why, you know, these kind of labels as revisionist or deconstructionist or experimental cinema doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, you know, the experimental is the worst word, you know, has ever used to the cinema, uh, in the cinema history. Uh, because it doesn't mean anything, because every art is experimental. You know, you cannot say that, you know, experimental poetry, uh, because, you know, <laughs> ex experimental literature, there is no kind of genre like this. But in cinema, there is experimental because basically it is non narrative and it's, you know, it's not the film we used to see, you know, 
uh, Transformers 3 or Jean-Luc Godard. Maybe Jean-Luc Godard is closer to Experimenta Simon. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, again, I started to speak, you know, long sentences and I forget the, you know, the core Take of the sentence. Time. But, uh, yeah, I, you have to make, you know, you have to, re be, you have to be a revisionist uh, in, and uh, you have to provocate uh, you know any kind of filmmaking because you know uh, at the end you in you know if if you, your goal is to you know to have more viewers or to you know uh, have a more applause a bigger applause at the cinema and you know uh, Oscar award or anything any kind of this it's not you know it's not the there is, you know, it's so boring <laughs> because it's your aim is to, you know, have more audience. It's so boring because it's there is two options: you get the audience or not. If you want to get win an award, it's so boring because there is two options: to win an award or win an award or not. But to experiment or you know to create something which is, you know, absolutely, you know, crazy or stupid or you know, trash or any kind of these labels, which in use this kind for this kind of cinema is more interesting because there is no only just A and B, you know, win and not win. It's it's more interesting for us. Uh, well, in a way, you are saying all kinds of cinema are linked to a certain kind of deconstruction and maybe to a little bit of experimentation. I think you're with that you are maybe denying that there is films which are also reproducing ideologies and could be prob problematic or manip but <coughs> manipulative. Um, uh, but can you give me an example, you know, just... You know. Take a Marvel franchise which is intended to keep people following um, the series and go to the cinema and be entertained. It's not questioning any routines or labels, role models. Yeah, but uh, I don't... Maybe you won't agree, but... <laughs> yeah, I don't see, you know, contemporary Hollywood movie, you know, as a... in this kind of political or, um, you know, more self-conscious way. I, I, I see this, you know, Marvel movies as, you know, they try to, you know, making something new in this kind of genre or this kind of... Uh, uh, Hollywood uh, genre tradition, which is, you know, can be, in a political way, can be shit, as, you know, we can read uh, a lot of Hollywood films in, for example, in from feminist uh, point of view as shit, or Marxist point of view as shit, uh, and we have two. So, but I, I don't read, you know, I don't see them uh, only in this way, you know, that's why I asked you give me an example because we can speak about you know exact films for example this this Marvel film uh, is you know problematic because um, in a political question for example we have this new Marvel movie Black Panther we, we created a lot of uh, you know political discussions uh, um, but I in general I don't see Hollywood I really uh, love the you know the history and the and anything with you know this kind of mainstream cinema. I'm not a political. We are not a political or experimental filmmakers. F uh, you know we make films in a form which you know move us, uh, and this form uh, can be you know you know can be put in a political context as any Hollywood or any kind of movie can be a political context. So. Um, yeah, we have to speak about, you know, precise film uh, if we speak about films. So that's why I, you know, a little bit uh, go out from the answering for your question that uh, we have to speak about precise film, films if we speak about anything, uh, I think. Um, what about propaganda films, for example? If we talk about transformation, um, I'm wondering whether there is a negative connotation to that term. Um, Jean-Pierre Becolo, would you say 
propaganda film as maybe an uh, like a antithesis to to uh, a progressive or experimental um, term of transformation. Okay, I would say okay, propaganda. If, I mean, I think the first propaganda films are really like commercials. You know, it, it's a film where that is made because those who make it want you to kind of behave a certain way in real life. I think that, I mean, it's kind of have a kind of clear intention of getting you in real life to do something or to be something. Um, so doing a commercial, for example, is selling you whatever this car, and then you take your own money and go and buy the car somehow. Uh, and I guess the political propaganda is almost like either you accept the regime that is dictatorial or you are scared of whatever to speak up or to so um, but uh, I would say cinema could also be just seen as a media of propaganda it doesn't matter what you put in it uh, me I did a film also that was banned in Cameroon it's called The President mm -hmm. and I think uh, what made them ban it is also because they were afraid of the, the reverse propaganda You know, because the president is supposed to be this or that. And now when you do something like against it, or then they stop it. Um, so maybe it's just a medium uh, of a form of propaganda. The screen is big. You know, just the small policeman you see every day in cinema become very big. Whatever he does takes like great dimension. Um, so I would say, um, obviously, it's what Hollywood is using in many ways, uh, this propaganda medium, you know, and use it to do all kind of propaganda, uh, s selling whatever, you know, uh, anything American, you know, it's, you know, it becomes big when you're not American. You know, you can have people in the middle of Africa dreaming of, I don't know, Bruce Willis or whatever, you know, just because I try to be Bruce Willis every day, you know, because they saw it in the film. Um, so now it goes back to capitalism, where is the ability to push your film globally and to open it in 5,000 theaters, you know, at the same time, and uh, that now makes you win. So... Uh, so independent films that barely find one cinema. Uh, while you know that this Hollywood film is getting 1,000 cinemas, you know, that's where the whole game is kind of in balance. And even worse, they would allocate more resources to show the film than to make it. Uh, if the film costs, I don't know, 10 million, whatever, and then they'll put 20 million to release it. So I think... The capitalism, the capitalistic system is actually very clearly like uh, making us accept the other propaganda uh, because we kind of accept the idea of uh, if you're poor, you're poor, you just say that's life. God maybe made me poor and God made the other one rich. But that's the kind of way people on a daily basis accept the, the, the capitalistic uh, uh, discrepancy. Or, um, so I would say that um, we cannot ignore that uh, dimension of cinema. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think Hollywood films are the best or are, uh, just those that are being seen uh, and that are being seen globally and can start a conversation that is global. Now everybody talk about Black Panthers while I'm sure that There are many great films that should spark a conversation here, <laughs> but better here than that film. But that's the one that is all over and media coverage. So all that is money also. So And I think they also make people shut up with this uh, because when it's financially successful, you have to shut up, which is also kind of censorship. It's like, you know, what? who are you to criticize a film that is making $400 million in, I don't know, a week? So I think that's the power of capitalism and propaganda mixed together. Did you ever feel like you as an 
or artist, as a filmmaker, that this influences, that this um, whole system that you just um, explained, that it changed you and your work and your art? Have you been at the point where you, where you felt um, um, my work is changing now, or now, or I want to um, try something else because I have to change in in my in my own perspective. Okay, it could be very tempting to wish you had access to the same propaganda, but sometimes I like to be the underdog. <laughs> you know, when you have a big system, I like to be you know like not the big system. You know. Uh, Uh, because I think it's more meaningful, and at least I don't. I'm not sure. I want to be on the side of the big things, you know, really that are crushing everybody. I don't know. I think I'll, uh, you know, you keep a kind of lucidity, kind of uh, accuracy. I don't know because you can watch what things that are going on and not be an actor of this power game at the end of the day. Um, but I would say also that. Um, Uh, I also like any system that allow you to 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 to, to say what you feel like saying, to, to be free, kind of, because all these systems kind of take away your freedom, even as a filmmaker. So making a film becomes like building a car. Uh, I don't think it's really like about a film anymore. It's just an expression. It looks the same, <laughs> but I don't think uh, it's the same process. Uh, it takes a whole different dimension. And uh, we are not doing the same thing, really. It's a whole different profession, I think. Mm, the maybe we could call it the apparatus of commer commercial cinema, um, however we want to call it. Um, we might say that this is maybe linked to a certain kind of violence as well. Would you say so? It's it's trying to agitate a large amount of people. Um, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Now, if we are all, I mean, it depends. You know, some people might not agree. You know, with the, with I uh, go back to capitalism as a model. You know, uh, um, obviously, we don't always see what it does. You know, I, uh, we don't always see what it does. We can benefit from what we like to have access to. We had a good evening going to watch this Hollywood film. So we benefit from it somehow. But we don't know what is behind. Uh, we are happy to have an, a good telephone, but we don't know the process that made the telephone. We can go and buy these clothes. We don't really always feel like... Uh, we think about our comfort first before we kind of feel the consequence. But if we are working the same Earth on the same planet, Obviously, there are some maybe kids who are being exploited to make the clothes we have. But if we decide to ignore it, we just feel like I want to get dressed, you know. So I think that's what we are into. Uh, obviously, having a holistic view of the world we live in is not easy. And also, you have to go through a lot of battles, even for yourself to be conscious. You know, uh, everything makes you not really think about it or not be really clear about what you should even do, you know, in, in that context. I don't know if it's a kind of violence, but it's um, uh, clearly um, an alienation somehow. Do you see, um, Peter Bory, to everybody, um, do you see a, a certain battle as maybe also an interesting word, uh, or, or a violent potential in any of the two films we screened tonight? You in your own, do you perceive a violence in the strategies you use? towards the material. Uh, well, I don't really see violence between the two films. Um, the violence I see, it's not between them, but it's within them. You know, like each has its battle. Um, yeah, battling with the, with a certain kind of metamorphosis, um, being in the culture of metamorphosis and um, in the culture of, you know, in the border of the culture of um, identity, maybe. And um, 
What I see um, is the violence of trying to cross borders and um, finding our, uh, their own way to live through. Yeah, and when also, um, I mean, violence means also deciding if something's visible or if something's not visible. And um, I mean, um, images are not only created by the um, the directors that are um, give the images, but also of the places where these images are shown, and if they are visible on festivals, and um, where they um, how they find their way one could say. Um, so um, do you think that um, festivals can also transform these um, perspectives um, of, um, of cinema that we're talking about? How can they, um, how can they um, have influence on that? Uh, Jean-Pierre, you, you were writing a public letter towards the uh, way Berlinale selected one of your films. Um, and to not. Could you talk about that one? Yes, I think it's uh, maybe um, it's still connected with uh, some of the, go back to the principle of capitalism in that way where you're feeling that what is happening is uh, obviously to please the audience. But pleasing the audience with the kind of work that was not maybe done to please the audience. Maybe that was to provoke them, maybe to create discussions, but they're still trying just to please the audience. At the end, the audience is a buyer, a consumer. A consumer. So, and this specific case was in relation to Africa in many ways. Um, uh, the, the, the whole idea of, uh, because, okay, I took these films as um, just a model where, okay, I have a few films where it was mainly, I would say, a mix, meaning it was not just Africans, uh, it was a kind of encounter, meaning Africa maybe and Europe, or Europeans, like in the case of this uh, historical piece on uh, the first encounters between Cameroon, Jews, and uh, the first uh, German colonizer. And then the, the other one was on Oh, I would just say mainly race relations. But it was clear that um, the choice was put on the, the third film that was a documentary on intellectual Africans discussing. Even if Berlinal is not a place where you can actually go deep in discussions, uh, because this material needed like a lot of discussions. But it was really to kind of how do you call it, not escape, but uh, avoid anything that will spark a discussion, anything that will be about exchange and considering that it's a um, uh, uh, festival, I mean, should be that place where we discuss and where we have a conversation. And I think uh, all these conversation somehow uh, were kind of avoided uh, in a very petit bourgeois way, where the comfort of the audience was at stake. Welcome, Madeleine. <laughs> you are here welcome. with us. <laughs> Finally. Please welcome Madeleine Bernstorff. Hi, hi. I survived. So we talked a lot of it about uh, the films already and about transformative uh, energies they have in the film, but also um, their effects on uh, on the audiences. Um, now we made a jump to uh, festivals, and um, but I mean you saw the films to um, loop you in the discussion. Now you saw the film both both of the films already. No, no, oh. <laughs> no, because I'm you know this very old school cinema person, and I think cinema is a social experience and a big screen and. To see, well, especially the rub on a computer doesn't really see, mean seeing it. So I can say I didn't see it. I was looking forward to see it. Yeah. 
What were your expectations? Yeah, because you know that it's a it's a it's a relation between sound and image, and if you see it big, you, you there's another relation, and of course the the film is very, uh, I would say, it has this uh, kind of th this ambivalence maybe of immersive, empathic. Uh, deconstructive, whatever. So it's maybe you, you've tackled all these questions already, but I think it's, I was looking so much forward to see this on the screen. So <laughs> I hope you had a wonderful world premiere. And you're working amongst others um, as a curator at the Oberhausen Short Film Festival? Not as a curator, as a programmer. As a programmer. Which is a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have I have in my body now uh, like the experience of 1,085 films which went through me. So you can look at me as a kind of special creature. <laughs> so these films transformed you even before you arrived. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I'm a bit beyond actually. Yeah. Is there a way of transformative programming? Is there a way to program films to agitate? the audience well there's a there's a, there's a long or there's a huge question with critics week about the question of activism and activate because you you published like i think 3 years ago this uh, leaf this leaflet for an activist film criticism where i always thought i think this word activism is a bit problematic in this connection. I have a bit a different connection, but of course it's uh, about films and as we were just, well I just uh, jumped in, but uh, uh, you were talking about how festivals work and how deep you can get into discussions and how how whether it's just a cozy discussion or where you can get deeper into it, it's that's the big question. And what I really like about Critics Week, you also wrote somewhere, it's not about this Q&A thing, which means like, you know, you command somebody to answer in maybe one sentence and that's it. And that's actually, so that's how I understand you you do this here and we do this in Oberhausen. We have like, it's more like Werkstattgespräche, like, you know, you try to find out what's behind this work, which as a programmer, you have been fighting for it. You have been like hating your colleagues because they didn't like it maybe, or you had to find a lot of, uh, you, you were arguing and then, then, then there's the person and then, if it's really nice, then the person has a whole <coughs> background behind him or her. Uh, you worked on a on a feminist film, we should maybe could say collective called uh, Blick Pilotin, yeah. um, which would be translated maybe as um, Pilot of the Gays um, or similar to that. Um, to uh, to agitate uh, the consciousness of people, does it need a certain amount of control? Control? Control. To agitate people? I don't I don't uh, get the question. I guess the project is linked to uh, changing um yeah. to changing oh, perceptions. You mean the, the pilot and like you know, having navigating. I never thought about this. It's actually because when you work as a group you you in a way there are struggles, there the you have to surrender so i think maybe it's um control meaning also like the force in a way or um in a way or, or having the force to to navigate on something and we were also talking about um like um if the films are violent in a way if it's violent to um get really physical with film material that's what we were talking about earlier and then we were talking about um, Jean-Pierre Bécolo's films. They are didactic in a way. 
um, and in, in which sense also um, having a feminist approach on, on film or on how film is taught or how film knowledge um, is put together and how much force that's al that also needs in a way to, um, to translate that or to talk about it. Because you you haven't if you if you talk about um, um, I mean with a Blick Pilotin um, this association you also had sort of a, an agenda in a way didn't you I mean you wrote yeah, a leaflet we, um, we wanted to uh, show actually we wanted to have a, a feminist uh, communal cinema but it, this was in eighty nine and then the wall break d broke down and then the the agendas were very different actually but they were agendas weren't they yeah but it was like uh, you know and then we were and then we were showing films wherever in different places but i think uh, actually for me a more recent project which was also a group project uh was the group, and this was very interesting for me also because I worked all of the other members of the group, we were five, and being part of a uh, bigger platform uh, of people who were organizing this tribunal against the NSU, uh, about the NSU complex, about this uh, neo-Nazi racist killings in Germany, which I think is the most, uh, one of the, biggest political scandal in, in Germany. So we organized a group where we asked, commissioned people, artists, <laughs> filmmakers, activists, uh, to do small spots to activate for this tribunal, but also go to be further on. And this was very interesting for me because uh, there was my question being 20 years, my questions being 20 years older and having certain group experiences and the others being younger and this was super super interesting i think it's uh, and it was also interesting to work on the small form and actually think about the activist the cine tract uh, how how could it be like two minutes three minutes uh, spots which we which we actually they are in the internet you can find them but the more interesting thing, and that was for me something I really experienced. It's the internet is lovely, but it, as we all know, it creates some bubbles. But what we managed with these small spots, uh, we could they were put into the how you say the advertisement uh, block of the cinemas. I think Hagerschulhof would not, but there's a big chain of cinemas here in Berlin, and they they showed them in between the advertisement, which means, of course, it's another way of speaking with people and surprising people. I'm wondering, beyond all the contexts or the ways we show films and discuss them, um, Peter, can there be actually an image which in is in itself changing us, which we cannot and see after we have seen it. Uh, you mean, can an image change us an audi as an audience? Um, I hope an image can't change us. Uh, I'm certainly, I hasn't found that image yet. Uh, I hasn't seen that image yet, which, you know, changed me as a person, you know, in that moment, um, but I would like to, you know, make this kind of images or see this kind of images. You know, I just saw images as moving images, which I really, you know, <laughs> deeply moved me or I really liked me. But, you know, maybe every, you know, films which moved me has changed me a little bit, but I never feel that, you know, that uh, a film completely changed me after the viewing or, you know. Um, but every filmmaker wants, I mean, wants to make a film like this. Uh, you know, even 
uh, I think even Hollywood filmmakers want to make films, but uh, in a you know maybe a different uh, aesthetic agenda. Jean Pierre and Madeleine, um, are there are there such images for you? Um, uh, uh, <coughs> okay, maybe just talk about images is kind of reducing a little bit the whole process. Uh, I, I like the example of um, like in Cameroon and in other countries, a lot of the cinema have closed. And they have been transformed into two things, churches and a supermarket. So the idea of the dream cinema is supposed to carry feels like it's kind of going away to leave space to the miracles. Because the supermarket is kind of a miracle uh, when you have the money, for sure. You know, you dream the of something. Is a miracle. Uh, it's like you dream about something. Cinema is like the dream, but then you get it if you have the money. And actually, this church, I remember, it was written: pray until something happens. So you could see that, if, if symbolically, the cinema is now becoming a church, and people, and they are full of people. I mean, I wish I had that many people for my screenings, but you kind of feel that churches having uh, br having this miracle or carrying this miracle people all kind of dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And maybe the interactivity also of social media, if you used to dream about, I don't know, Brad Pitt, watching him, now you can get your own Brad Pitt. <laughs> I mean, maybe not the same, but at least the interaction make the miracle a little bit possible. So in some ways... I can feel that uh, uh, maybe the whole dream thing is over or uh, is about to disappear and we are kind of living more in a kind of miracle uh, world. I mean, at least that's an aspiration. Um, and that's the transformation. I mean, I think people, uh, if I, based on what I've just said, you know, the, the, the dream is becoming old school kind of somehow. Can you um, could you further describe what you mean by miracle? I would say is the, the idea that um, you have a before and an after. I guess that's what you meant when you watch a film. You have a before and an after. You know the transformation in it for you. But considering this whole materialistic world and capitalistic world, the miracle is that you, you dream about something, you get it. You know, a very pragmatic uh, relation because the poetry is kind of vanishing, you know, the whole um, dreaming, you know, uh, fantasy, you know, but now it's very pragmatic about, you know, I get, what do I get out of this? Uh, and I think, I feel that the world is getting that way and uh, Somehow and somehow, and so maybe, uh, maybe filmmakers should become miracle makers, <laughs> meaning the preachers in, in the, for this of this church, or the owner of these shops. Uh, uh, I think when you go, I remember back in the days growing up in Cameroon. Obviously, you had some people who were like around cinema just like to live around the movie theaters because. Obviously, in the movie theaters, you had these kind of dreams, you know, and they just kind of identify with whatever was in the film. And then, I think, mainly in many places, maybe like in, I would see in French suburbs or even in, in America, in all these poor neighborhoods, where people gather is in front, front of Walmart. I mean, Walmart, which is like the shopping center malls. You can feel like they're also around it, like people were around the cinema. Uh, but now they're around the malls, even if you have no money. So I think somehow um, the transformation here is actually 
now becoming what you get or what you can get materially and not anymore the spiritual power of cinema somehow. Talking about before and after, um, maybe we can continue our conversation in a standing position outside with a drink. Um, so you know, I would say we are sitting in the audience and we didn't even open for the audience. But ah, yeah, if anyone right. has, who is still here wants to wants to raise a question, that's the chance. That's true. Do, yeah, we have we have all the time. So in case anybody wants to ask something, aha. Uh -huh. So um, considering the um, ways the the rub was made to bury the material in the ground and the sort of lack of control you have um, on what happens to the images, I was wondering if um, transformation always has a kind of um, non-intentional aspect to it. Uh, I... I can be I can be really quick. Uh, yes, uh, that's the fun. That's the fun part of the making the unintentional, you know, little details. Uh, because, you know, if it would be absolutely non unintentional, it would be created in digital 3D, super HD uh, graphic, and. Um, it's always the unintentional randomness is the great on the images uh, because every everything is you know basically unintentional. What you see, y we know you know as a receipt uh, how to if we put you know the film in a bleacher and we learn that if we put the film in a soil, it will be happen like this. Uh, so we learned how the receipt, uh, you know, as making the film, we learned the receipt of the film, because there is no receipt uh, of this kind of filmmaking. And um, but the fun part is the unintentional part, because it, you know, strike us. We just, you know, get the image and, who it's great, you know, this this is the best part of the filmmaking, um, and. You know, it's 80%, 70% unintentional. Uh, doing, you know, the, the graphical part and the editing is the 100%, you know, what's the opposite of unintentional? Unintention okay, so it's 100% intentional when you make the, the editing. But um, it's happening in the digital phase. So our film is you know, it's not only celluloid, it is digital. So, because we have to make digital photographs of all of the field frames. And it's, you, what you saw is around 40,000 digital photographs. Um, so, it's kind of hybrid. It's not celluloid, because you, you haven't seen the celluloid. The celluloid is much more beautiful. Uh, you see in a digital image, but with uh, a celluloid projector, you cannot see this kind of film. Even with an uh, optical printer, you cannot see the film. Because you cannot put this kind of celluloid strips into the optical printer because you will kill it. So, um, yeah. And the painting? Maybe you spoke about this already. The painting comes in when? Uh, well, it's the first part. Oh. Um, the very first part. We collected all the material and then um, we basically used almost all of them. Um, we, we started to paint them and buried them um, and used chemicals on them and then um, we just digitized them. But I mean, um, talking about coincidences, you can't convince me that it happened by coincidence that you bury the film strips, bleach them, painted them. So there, in some way there is a strong sense of intentionality to your film, I believe. 
Yeah, so it's not happened that uh, I get in my hand a uh, shallow and start to dig in the garden and oh, it's a coincidence. There is a 35 millimeter film in the garden. No, uh, you know, we heard about this kind of, you know, technique because, you know, we knew that the celluloid is basically organic or part of the celluloid is organic and if you rot the, you know, you can rot it and it's, it's a new image. And uh, there, are, there is a German filmmaker, Jürgen Rebel, who makes, you know, this kind of films, you know, since, I don't know, 30 years. Um, and, th you know, this is a deconstruction of celluloid is a big tradition, you know, we didn't invent it anything, we just used the tradition as, you know, Marvel films use the tradition uh, of comic strip and Hollywood filmmaking, we use the tradition of experiment, so-called experimental cinema, and we use the tradition of Hamlet, so basically it was a very traditional film, <laughs> um, what you saw. I have a question. <coughs> Um, because Jean-Pierre wrote this open letter and um, Madeleine is now here also, um, I was wondering whether there's a tendency of festivals to only or to prefer showing films by um, people from a certain region about that region. Um, so um, as you pointed out, um, black people talking with black people about black people um, and whether this is one of the transformations um, you're, you'd like to claim for um, opening, uh, um, opening the world to seeing, you know, different perspectives and you as a Cameroon director being able to um, talk and show and um, discuss problems of white people from your perspective and um, uh, how we can get there. So she's supposed to answer. <laughs> Both of you. <coughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, no, Madlan, yeah. maybe as a out of a Professor. programmer's perspective, um, how I think this can be a question. I'm I'm sure that you've thought about this question. Yeah, of course. It's you know we we where is if I speak now about um, the experience just behind me, we we try to. Uh, find films which speak about a transnational experience, which is actually somehow, I also experience this with students, that it's very different when, when people ca are kind in their cozy, uh, never left the place um, upbringing, then they have to, uh, they struggle a little bit if there is a film which tells a transnational experience, which means maybe sometimes there is a, you know, you don't, uh, there's this moment of disorientation, are you here or are you there? This is very, very obvious in films and you can see how people, and it's, it's necessary to speak that there are different experiences and then of course there's uh, and as a programmer, again, uh, we try to we try to to uh, have a vast range, uh, always being at the edge of thinking. Oh, we have to show a film of this country because we want to have a bigger range. We don't want to have the Anglo-American monoform or what, however you call it, and that it's. It's of course, and it's more work, and this is my experience from from uh, feminist cinema. You know, you always it, it's always we always had this argument. Oh, but there aren't so many women. But then it's actually it's more work to find, and especially you know, I was in in two thousand one when I had started at the festival. I there was no money to go to any African places, countries, there was no money to go to Ouagadougou, so I went to Paris and I was there like 14 days to find African cinema. And it was in 2000, it's, I think it has, there has, something has changed, I would say, but still, and also, you know, it's a problem to speak about African cinema, we know this also, <laughs> uh, but 
you know, of course, it's 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 a lot of work. We have in our commission. There is one person. She speaks Russian, and she's looking for films in Russia. And this is much more difficult because you have an authoritarian uh, 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 structures. And or I I remember being in in Morocco at the festival, and also there is the. Centre Cinématographique Marocain, and it's also a very authoritarian uh, structure, and you have to deal and subvert and surround, and you know, it's it's not like, and of course, the, the and years before, you know, we w when I started working for the festival, we had these VHS, and of course, the VHS tapes, they came mostly also from the countries you yeah you expect is it an <coughs> answer okay uh what i would like to say is that we, we the, the the thing is that we don't we are making we don't making films for festivals we're making films because we don't like the world we live in because we want something to change or to be different um and festivals are part of you know what's happening, uh, so. so um, um, but but the feeling that um, we are in a perpetual ignorance of the Western world. So what they give to you, they always say, you know, people here don't know. You know, they don't know. They don't. Know. So you wonder when they would know, actually, or if. Even there's a project that, so how do you know? So it's always going to be Africa for beginners, for dummies. You know, that's kind of what it is. Uh, and, and it keeps repeating itself, like always, like, no, they don't know. They never know. After 20 years, they still don't know. Uh, so we always, uh, uh, and the idea that the choices being made, like, this is good for my audience. It, obviously, maybe there's no way to go around it, but um, and you feel like okay, it's the choice, but you wonder uh, uh, what it actually means because I remember uh, I think it's the the article Stanley who went to Africa looking for Livingstone. I think he was writing in the, what was back in those days the kind of New York Times. And he was the one describing the tribes he was meeting. So he was the one telling the Western world what Africa is about. And that perspective of Stanley hasn't changed much, really, when you think about it. Mm, all this sensational story, whatever. So it's kind of has produced the kind of imaginary on the continent that is still on today. So we're living at the age where you have so much social media, all this information, I don't know how many TV channels, but people still don't know. So you wonder, as a filmmaker, you say, okay, obviously, I'm not going to make the same films as, because each TV channel has done something on Africa. Most of, I don't know, in the world, I don't even know if you go to Japan, you go to China, they all send reporters to Africa, and they take their own story of Africa and tell their people what Africans are all about. You know, and you wonder, okay, now I'm going to make a film, should I just do the same again? And now when you watch, you, you, you look at a place like Berlinale, Berlinale also have this World Cinema Fund. They don't just show film, they fund them. So you realize that there's a kind of dynamic here where they decide what is a good or at least interesting African film for them give the money and show and show it uh, but my question is uh, and that's in connection with one of the fame because one of my fame was um, uh, uh, it's a colonial history it's uh, um, so because somebody obviously there's a discomfort on seeing how African would depict Germans but I also also say do you imagine what Africans would feel after watching all these countries who are depicting them every day in all these TV channels. So I just think having this kind of gaze, let's say exchange of gaze, I don't mean that the gaze from Africa would be better or the other one, but just the idea that we could 
be a more fair or gay is like if Af the, the Europe is looking at Africa, Africa should also be able to look at Europe. And then somehow, you know, we find kind of common ground. So I think we stuck, really. Uh, and um, and the festival is supposed to be a place that is open. So a TV channel might be different because it's more business, it's more. But I say a festival is a place where some kind of conversation should be possible. And what is kind of depressing for me is that um, it's almost that you feel that in the space that is the most open, you know, there is still no conversation that is possible. And and me, I'm, I, I believe in the, 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 the kind of idea of encounter. You know, uh, uh, colonialism was the first encounter. Uh, uh, but today, you know, you feel that we don't want to to have a second encounter, maybe for some reason, I don't know, uh, uh, because of everything that was said, but I still think when you look at the world today, the second encounter should happen. Um, I, I came back from Congo, I think two months ago, Lubumbashi. I discovered that while I was there, an article was published of Volkswagen coming to buy cobalt for something like 90 billion euros. And I was in Lubumbashi where they have the cobalt. And I was talking to Congo guy, Congolese guys who didn't know about it. And they wonder where are the 90 billion euros going to go? You know? Uh, and this is Volkswagen who's going to produce, I think, 3 million cars starting in three years. I don't see how we can, this could happen and there's no discussion, at least as filmmakers. You know, obviously, maybe the Berlinale will be sponsored by Volkswagen, <laughs> but I'm just feeling that uh, it means that we are repeating uh, after all these years, you know, some of these things we, we kind of all criticized. Uh, and I'm very shocked that people I know, you know, I see every day, and some are even friends, don't want to have that conversation. Uh, Madeleine, earlier we were talking about um, the question whether a transformation within society or a, a transformation of a system needs knowledge first. And we were just talking about a lack of knowledge. Um, do you think it's still... Uh, how, how, do we, how do we proceed? How do we proceed? Yeah. <laughs> how, can we, how can we evolve the way we look at the world when on some angles there's not enough, people don't know enough or um, don't have a routine which allows them to reflect. Yeah, but, uh, you know, the, the information is, there's a lot of information. That's the, qu the yes. question how you... And, and you know, of course, films is more than... Uh, because I, when as a curator, I was like programming, curating films in the field of more closer to the art, but the more political art scene. So I always had this experience, the, the, those people, they want films that tell about this and tell about that. Isn't there a film which tells this? And then there's the cinephiles and they just are completely, how you say, oblivious of worldly things. They don't, uh, you know, they want more like having this deep experience and going on. So maybe this is much too easy as a, as a how you say, as a contradiction. But of course, it's a, it's a way where one moves. And, and films have the possibility to let you experience things. And this is more like, no, and w how is knowing and experience? This is the same thing with teaching. Uh, you know, like film studies, as I experience this very often, is like people reading text, reading text, reading text, and in the end, they are allowed to see whether, and uh, to check whether the film they see is actually that what, what is written in the text. The, the, the film has to, prove or not prove whether the text is right, that's all. And 
my idea is different, you know. Let's experience and then start to find language <coughs> and maybe start very low and share and have a debate. And that's, that's for me, you know, like learning to know. I think that's a great ending and we should go and um, uh, take the debate to the bar and talk about it further there with a drink. Yeah, I'd love to have a drink. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. Thanks for being here with us. Yeah, thank you, Jean-Pierre Bacolo. Thank you, Madeleine Bernstorff. Thank you, Bori Maté and Peter Lichter. And thanks to all of you who stayed for such a long time. And who we will be back tomorrow, Thursday, eight o'clock, to show Lukas Feigefeld's Hagasusa. And we will have as our guests um, at the debate Sylvia Szymanski and Thomas Aslan. And, and of director. course, Lukas, yeah, the director. <laughs>